Uh, Murray Sinclair has not just had an extraordinary career, uh, he's had an extraordinary life, and he is, to my thinking, uh, an extraordinary person, an extraordinary Canadian. His life is rooted in honest conversation, in promoting ongoing dialogue between Indigenous peoples and the rest of Canada about fairness, justice, respect, reconciliation. Born and raised on the then St. Peter's Indian Reserve in the Selkirk area north of Winnipeg, Senator St. Clair is a renowned lawyer, judge, and Indigenous leader. He's also a father and a grandfather. He writes letters to his grandchildren as a way to inform and educate them about their culture, traditions, and background. And it's a way, too, of giving them a glimpse into the life of their old and generous grandfather and those who helped shape him. As a young boy, Senator Sinclair was inspired by his aunt, a teacher, who instilled in him a love of reading and appreciation of the importance of education. At her behest, he read the entire Book of Knowledge, an encyclopedia of many volumes. Eventually, he found his way to law school, considering it a stepping stone to politics, a means to an end. But it became an end, I suppose, in itself. All of that changed when Senator Murray began to really enjoy law, excelling in the competitive environment of the courtroom, litigating land claims and other issues. He became a judge and presided over important inquiries in Manitoba and beyond. Four years ago, Senator Sinclair was appointed to the Canadian Senate. Again, this was a means to an end. It was his way, his way of ensuring he had a platform to continue the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and keep the conversation going. I'm pretty certain it wasn't the political cur he originally, originally conceived of, but again, it's something that he has done with his usual aplomb. Not surprisingly, he describes his leadership style as honest. For his lifelong work in the law, on the bench, now in the Senate, the Public Policy Forum recognizes Senator Marie Conclair, Sinclair as a recipient of our highest honor. And Senator Sinclair, I want to congratulate you on your award. And I want to say on behalf of PPF directors and my colleagues how honored we are to be able to honor you and welcome to this forum. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much for the, uh, the kind introduction and uh, also for the um, <laughs> wonderful award. I, I was moving things around on my desk and, and I put it behind me thinking that it would be more visible back there, but as often as the case, sometimes my head gets in the way. Uh, so um, I just wanted to, uh, to thank you for that uh, generous uh, award and and for the invitation to be part of this uh, evening's activities and <clears throat> I want to acknowledge as well the, the two previous speakers I found your presentation fascinating particularly as a father of a woman who is an uh, informatic specialist she writes code for um, many companies and uh, she, she, she <laughs> we often tell the story that when she was in high school, she wanted to drop out of high school because she couldn't stand mathematics. And we hired a tutor for her in order to uh, teach her uh, some of the very fundamental issues around mathematics. But it was not that she didn't understand it, it's that she thought the teachers were stupid and were not teaching her what she wanted to know. <laughs> so, so as a result of that, she went into coding. And now she's a... Uh, um, she spends her spare time teaching young indigenous girls in downtown Winnipeg how to code. And uh, they really love it because it's a, it's a real interesting form of communication for them. So thank you for your presentation and for sharing your experience as well. Well, you know, and I, I want to uh, also reach up. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I just also wanted to acknowledge and, and reach out uh, my hands to uh, my, uh, she called me little brother. So that means I have to call her big sister, <laughs> Claudette. <laughs> so, although for those of you who know Claudette will know that she's probably four foot one or something like that. <laughs> but she's a, a powerful woman. And and every time that we get together, we, we always end up uh, teasing each other. So 
thank you very much for the acknowledgments uh, that you've given me, Claudette, not just today, but in many other uh, events that we've participated in. And I appreciate your work as well. And uh, so uh, thank you for that. And thank you for uh, getting us off in a good way. As you were speaking the language, of course, uh, it reminds me of the importance of our language and the importance of uh, who we are, importance of understanding um, where we come from, importance of understanding why we're here. And um, as one elder told me at a point in my career when I was thinking of quitting law, he said that um, your problem is that you can't be the kind of lawyer that you were meant to be because you don't know who you are. It's what he said. And so he said, go out and talk to the elders and find out what it means to be Anishinaabe. And then you will be the best lawyer that you can be. And that's what I set out to do. So I'm still working on that, which is why I went back to practicing law after I left the bench. Um, I'm trying to help other young lawyers as well uh, do that. Senator, and, let me let me let, let me let, let me come in with a uh, uh, let me come in for a second with, with okay. a question to you because uh, appropriately and typically you started off I think about the future and and looking forward through your daughter and coding and teaching uh, and teaching other kids. I want to I want to just um, I want to reflect back for a moment though, and then we'll come back to the present very quickly. Uh, I want to read a quote from you a couple of years back when you said, reconciliation is about atonement. It's about making amends. It's about apology. It's about recognizing responsibility. It's about accounting for what has gone on. But ultimately, it's about commitment to maintaining that mutually respectful relationship through recognizing that even when you establish it, there will be challenges to it. So it's about 10 years since you started down the road of uh, the Truth, Re Truth and Reconciliation Commission, five years about since your report and it's 94 calls to action. How are we doing in attaining that mutually respectful relationship that you uh, spoke about? Well, some of us are trying harder than others uh, and some of us are working at it in, in uh, appropriate ways and some are not. Uh, one of the things that I've often said is that you can't hope to establish a good relationship unless you figure out what kind of relationship you want to have and how you're going to get there. So it's about planning as well. And um, one of the problems I see, for example, with regard to government action, federal government in particular, but provincial and municipal governments as well, uh, is that uh, they're not actually sitting down and planning on how they can improve their relationship with Indigenous people. They just kind of take a shot at it from now, from, from time to time, and and then uh, say, well, okay, look what we've done. And, and that's not good enough. Um, you know, it's about establishing a relationship and it's about maintaining that relationship. And one of the things that I said as well, around the same time that that comment uh, uh, that you've just cited is that uh, reconciliation will take us a long time to achieve. It took us a long time to, to create this mess and it's gonna take us a long time to fix it. And we should expect that because it's taken seven generations, it may take us a number of generations before we get to a point where we can say, we have a mutually respectful relationship, which is what the ambition of reconciliation should be. In order to have that, we need to ensure that we understand not only the history of this country, but also what that history has done to each of us. Uh, it's not just Indigenous people who have been damaged by the history of uh, colonialism and oppression and uh, negative stereotyping and uh, racism, but it's the non-Indigenous people as well who've also been damaged by it. Uh, people often think that um, Indigenous people should just get over it and move on. Um, and my response to that is, well, I think that white people should just get over it and move back because uh, you have been... Um, educated to believe in white supremacy. You have been educated by the public school system to believe that colonialism is okay. You've been educated to believe that the doctrine of discovery, whether or not it's legal, doesn't really matter, but it's okay for us to rely upon it to justify taking over the lands of indigenous people. You've been educated to believe that indigenous people are inferior 
and had no civilization, had no history to speak of, and that the Europeans who came here to settle this country uh, were inherently superior. And because you've been educated to believe that, the governments historically have established policies, not just governments, but institutions, corporations as well, uh, have historically established policies, practices, and ways of doing things and thinking about things that ignores the pre-existing rights and the pre-existence of indigenous people who were here thousands and thousands of years before European arrival. And the result of all of that is indigenous people are saying, we are still here and non-indigenous people who are advocating against reconciliation are saying, well, so what, that doesn't matter. Well, an example of that may be something that many people might have watched on their uh, uh, television or computer screens just last night, and that was the, uh, um, the violence uh, that took place in, in Atlantic Canada against, uh, against Indigenous fishers. Um, and I, I'm wondering, you know, before the COVID-19 um, uh, came into our lives, you know, we had blockades that were going on across uh, Canada. Um, now we have um, non-Indigenous uh, uh, people, uh, um, you know, acting violently and, uh, and with intimidation against Indigenous fishers. How do you think this relationship, you know, w when you see this happening now, I know you've sort of counseled patients, but uh, it, must be, uh, it must be frustrating for you. Well, uh, in a situation like that, the, the one thing that I look for and that I, I hope for and that I really call for is leadership. Uh, our leaders need to stand up and, and tell the people who are acting violently, um, just hold on here. You are not entitled to do that. You are not um, in a position where you, anything that you do in that way is justified or justifiable. And it's, um, it's a hard message to give because they're politicians for the most part. And politicians are uh, burdened by vested interests to try to stay elected or get reelected. And, and so they don't want to give a message that people don't want to hear. And, and that's a difficult thing to say. And, and I was not impressed, for example, to hear the premier of Nova Scotia, the very site of where all of this is happening, saying it's a federal responsibility. It's a federal problem. They should fix it. Uh, when in reality, he's responsible for the administration of justice. He's responsible for the policing of those people who are committing crimes and committing acts of violence. And he should be demanding that the provincial police force, which in their case is the RCMP, that they intervene and not only prevent that from happening, but that they arrest people who are committing crimes and they're not doing it. Um, if you look in British Columbia, for example, when there was a blockade in British Columbia by the Wet'suwet'en people to prevent um, exploitation of resources, which they said they had never given consent to giving up, um, the RCMP were on them in massive force within hours almost. And, and they arrested hundreds of people. And the reality is that that imbalance of reaction that that uh, differential reaction uh, is uh, an example of the lack of fairness of the way that the system has been operating for indigenous people and non-indigenous people. And, and trying to get people to understand that and trying to get people to come to terms with it in a way that uh, makes it uh, work for us as Canadians in a way that would make us proud is very difficult. I, I, I want to just uh, take a moment to remind the audience to please submit your questions over chat. And I want to, Senator Sinclair, um, uh, just pull the camera back a little bit for a moment because we've had uh, months now of a uh, intense national and international conversation that has broken out about systemic racism. And I, I'm wondering, I'm wondering what you make of uh, of that conversation, and uh, and if you, you know, the extent to which you identify with it. <laughs> well, you know, it's a conversation um, 
by people uh, for the most part who don't really understand what they're talking about. And that's part of the problem is we've never caused people to study what systemic racism means and how it works and how it manifests itself. Uh, and what I tell people to keep it as, as simple as possible, and this is, I don't think this is oversimplifying it, systemic racism is, is that situation which allows people to say, I had no choice. And when the system makes you do something uh, that at the end of the day causes unfairness to the victim of your actions, um, then uh, it's systemic in nature. And, and uh, when, um, for example, if you take a, a situation where individuals are charged with an offense in the criminal justice system and you have to arrest somebody because you, you see them in a particular way or you think of them in a particular way um, because you believe that they are more involved than the non-Indigenous person is or the non-Black person is, um, and so you give one a warning and you arrest the other one. Uh, and you say, well, I, I had no choice because I have a training manual that says that in that situation, I have to do that. Or when you shoot somebody and you say, my training says I have to shoot somebody if they appear to be carrying a weapon um, without in fact uh, being absolutely certain that before you kill him, that it's not a cell phone in his hand. Um, uh, systemic racism is about impact and uh, racism itself is about intent. So when you intend to discriminate against somebody, that's racism. But when you don't intend to discriminate against somebody, but the end result of your decision-making process is that you have a, an extremely negative impact upon a particular community based on their race or their gender or their culture or their religion then that's systemic bias or systemic discrimination or systemic racism. So it's about effect. And, and that's what people need to understand. In a systemic racism situation, if you get rid of all of the racists in the system, and that's what everybody's trying to do is get rid of all of the racists in the police forces, for example. My point is that we're still gonna have overrepresentation because of the way the system uh, directs people. Uh, so, for example, our police forces are placed into communities where there are high numbers of Black people and high numbers of Indigenous people. And I've always said when I do presentations to judges, if anybody follows any one of you long enough, they'll find you breaking a law. And if they decide to charge you and arrest you and detain you, then you're going to end up in jail. And that's what happens with, with Indigenous people because the police over police them. Your distinction between intent and impact between racism and systemic racism um, uh, messes me up a little bit in terms of a question I was going to ask you. So I'll now adjust it somewhat. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I want to talk to you about uh, uh, Joyce Ekakwan, a 37 year old mother of seven who went to the hospital in Joliet, Quebec, and was taunted and insulted before her death. And Quebec has ordered, ordered an inquiry, but refuses to say this is a manifestation of systemic racism. I was going to ask, what does that refusal tell you? But I, instead, I'm going to ask you whether that's actually in your, uh, in the way you've just described it, uh, uh, perhaps not systemic racism in your description, but, uh, but racism. Um, intent, in, intent. It's both. And that's the thing that people are getting confused by is it's not an either or situation. You often have, for example, the police officers uh, that we see in the video who are doing things are acting in, in a racist way. There's no question of that. But they are then protected by policies and practices within the police act or the police code of conduct or the police training manual. They're acting in a way which protects them. And... In the same way, the situation in Quebec with the death of that, uh, that young mother and the way that she was uh, vilified and treated just prior to her death, clearly the people who were doing that were acting in a racist way. There's no question of that. But the system itself was also acting in a racist way 
uh, it was an example of, of systemic racism because um, there's no doubt in my mind, and I'm sure not in the minds of those who studied the question, because when you look at the VN Commission report, they clearly identified that particular hospital as a source of constant mistreatment of Indigenous people by non-Indigenous staff, and the hospital tolerated it. So that those people who were doing that, or that person in particular that we heard on the video, who were saying those things at that particular point in time, undoubtedly has said those things in the past, and the system tolerated her being able to say that. They didn't discipline her, they didn't remove her, they didn't fire her. They allowed her to stay on as a nursing attendant or nurse, whatever the position was that she held, and tolerated it and uh, continued to allow the system and allow the people within the system to abuse Indigenous people. Now, Senator, you and I have talked a few times over the last uh, few weeks, and we've talked about the uh, COVID situation. We talked about the COVID situation in your communities. I just wonder, just um, um, going from where we've been in this conversation, the extent that you worry or are concerned that the history of, uh, of uh, being ill-treated in hospital, some of the history you've shown of, uh, of testing against uh, without consent of, uh, of Indigenous peoples that you talk about in the TRC, if you wonder that this will prove potentially a barrier um, as we move toward a, a system in 2021 of, of vaccination and, and people having to have confidence in the system. And one of the um, findings that we pointed out in our report, and it was confirmed by findings in other commissions that were uh, studied, is that there is a very basic mistrust of the medical system by Indigenous people, uh, particularly where th there is um, a lack of consistent contact between the med medical practitioners, the nurses and the doctors, and the, in the individual patient. Um, so if you go... Um, to a medical treatment facility and uh, get treated by one physician at one point in time, and then you come back as a follow-up and you get treated by an entirely different person, you may end up with two different um, medical diagnoses and medical treatment plans. And as a result, uh, neither one of them may work for you. And, and so getting proper treatment from a medical a facility or medical practitioner historically has always been um, very uh, chancy and uh, it has created um, not only a lack of mistrust but sometimes a fear of going into those places um, and you know the other the other reality is that uh, uh, within the residential school system uh, the medical facilities that were provided within the schools were really places where children were sent to die. Uh, and that was the common phrase that the survivors told us about, that they hated being sent to the infirmary because they believed that they were being sent there to die. And, and they had good reason to believe that because they received almost absolutely no medical treatment in those infirmaries. They were simply allowed to, to lay there and not treated. And, and so, and sometimes, of course, they were experimented upon. We, we documented that in our report as well. And, uh, and of course, as Senator Boyer in her study that, that she did when she was a professor of law um, about the uh, non-consensual uh, treatment of Indigenous women in Saskatchewan who were uh, forcibly sterilized against their will or against their knowledge, um, is just another example of that. So that lack of faith in the, in the medical system um, is feeding the lack of willingness to engage with medical practitioners or believing even medical practitioners uh, today in the COVID environment. And, and uh, indigenous communities have been very fortunate to be able to show um, a relatively low number of uh, infections from the disease in their communities, but it's largely been because they've blockaded routes and prevented outsiders from coming in. And the communities that have not successfully blockaded the roads and kept people out 
are the communities where the cases have gone up very high. Um, so I have several more questions I'd like to ask you, but I do want to turn to the audience uh, uh, first. And uh, there's a couple of uh, interesting questions there. So I have one from uh, uh, from Moira Cheed of the Canadian Medical Association, and she's asking, uh, Senator Sinclair, do you see new patterns emerging or old patterns resurfacing regarding racism during COVID as a result of isolation, less family support and acute care as an example? Well, I think it's been counter, there, there's still that. Um, I think it's been counteracted though by the number of uh, medical practitioners from the indigenous community, uh, both in the nursing profession, as well as in the uh, uh, medical profession, we now see more Indigenous doctors than we've ever seen before. Um, I was at a graduation ceremony at the University of Manitoba, uh, I think it was two years ago, and they had almost 21, I think 21 um, graduates from medical school from the Indigenous community. And um, and so their intent has always been to go back to their communities and practice medicine. The, the problem they have though is if they wanna go back to their homes to practice medicine, um, there's no housing available to them. They got no place to live. And so they have to continue to travel in like get other medical practitioners from distant places um, unless they're uh, able to convince a the government authority to allow them to build. And that's not always easy to do because the approval process for building a, your own house on an Indian reserve is um, tantamount to running into walls at every turn. So uh, I would say that um, we still have it. I don't think there's any question of that. We still have um, mistreatment and racism on the part of medical practitioners to a certain extent. And, and, and some of that is unconscious racism too. Keep in mind, they're not even aware of how they see things. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's also uh, being counteracted by uh, those who are coming from the indigenous community. Although the problem with that, of course, is that they're almost all young practitioners who have very little influence in the profession generally. Now, now one of, uh, I think, uh, the surprises for many people in the COVID situation is that Indigenous communities have been so far, or at least uh, until perhaps the last few weeks, uh, less hard hit than, uh, than uh, people had expected. People were concerned uh, particularly because of pre-existing conditions and, uh, and living conditions, that this would be uh, a very hard hit uh, uh, series of communities. But the infection rate has been about one third of the Canadian average. Now we've seen some spiking of this in recent weeks and some spiking uh, near your home in, in Manitoba. Can you help us understand what's happening uh, in Indigenous communities with COVID? Yeah, first of all, the statistics don't tell you what's happening with the urban indigenous population. And I think the urban indigenous population is uh, because they're largely located in uh, the impoverished parts of uh, uh, the cities in the urban areas um, are probably harder hit than the general population is. And, and uh, it's because the, the statistical gathering mechanisms don't identify people by race when they uh, record this data. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. And we also have to keep in mind that over 63% of indigenous people live in urban areas now and have moved away from home communities, largely because of the insufficiency of resources and services in their own communities. And, um, and so as a result, uh, the data doesn't really tell the true picture. Um, and uh, there is a di very distinct difference between the infection rate uh, in Southern communities, which are more accessible to the general population. So you can literally drive through an Indian reserve uh, because many main highways in the South uh, will traverse indigenous uh, uh, First Nations territory. Um, so you can drive through the territory uh, and, and stop at a gas station or stop at a restaurant and uh, run that runs the risk of infection for the people there. Uh, and, uh, and we see that those numbers higher than in the North. And in the North, I think the ability to uh, exclude people through shutting down airports and shutting down uh, roadways into the community um, and blockading those roadways 
uh, and also the fact that there's a low uh, level of transportation into those communities anyway, uh, is largely, I think, spoken to the fact that those communities have succeeded in keeping the numbers down. Um, okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, uh, come to two personal questions as we move into the uh, last um, uh, part of the interview. Catherine from Ontario asks, You've been on the forefront of so many difficult Canada Indigenous issues for several decades. How do you keep from being discouraged and stay a resilient leader? I go to ceremony a lot. Um, I participate in sweat lodges. I, I have um, good spiritual advisors, elders who keep me strong. And um, as, I, as I often tell people, uh, <clears throat> the best elder I have is 14 years old. And she she keeps me going she she reminds me of uh, what i'm supposed to do and i always think about the young people now uh, about my responsibility to them so um, there is no time for me to sleep well you know uh you've said many times over the years you've told the story about uh how um uh and maybe this was before you had the 14 year old in your life so maybe this is the difference but you said how you turned down uh, the uh, first uh, uh several invitations or a couple of invitations you had to um to lead the trc and um here's a quote from you the reason i said no was because of the impact of doing the pediatric cardiac inquiry in winnipeg the emotional toll it uh, that that took on me was very, very difficult. Now, eventually you said yes, um, but then you saw the, you've been subjected to the emotional tool of, uh, of the thousands of people who you encountered who had gone through residential schools. So uh, how do you keep your gentle soul uh, and your lightheartedness, which, uh, which I've witnessed over our conversations the last few weeks, how, how do you keep those intact? Uh, well, again, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's about always keeping in mind what's really important. And uh, what's really important is the uh, future generations of this country. And, and also, you know, the, um, the, the people around me, the people, I suppose, who I haven't, may never have met, who rely upon me continuing to do this work. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, and you know, and I draw inspiration from um, looking at the the work of other great leaders who, who's, uh, uh, who have also been challenged to to do important things, and uh, and I think that um, knowing that uh, I'm not the first one to be in a situation of of constantly being bombarded by. Um, this uh, ongoing obligation to ensure that we do the right thing and that we uh, take care of this country or the people of this country the best way that we can uh, is, uh, is not lost upon me <clears throat> because as I say, I, I'm reminded of it by the elders, I'm reminded of it by the survivors and I, I see them all the time. In fact, my kids will not go out in public with me uh, anymore because they say that I can't go anywhere without people wanting to stop and talk and uh, and so when we go <laughs> when we go shopping for example for my wife my wife's birthday just a month ago uh, we went shopping they made me sit in the in the eating area of the mall um, while they went and, and decided what it was that I should buy her um, and they would bring me pictures of what it was that they thought I should buy because they said <laughs> if I were to walk through the, the mall halls, so to speak, the aisles, that people would just interrupt everything we were doing. So, and even as it was sitting in the at the, uh, the food court of a mall is, is uh, to surround yourself, to end up being surrounded by people who also want to talk. So uh, I have to say that it is about uh, keeping one sense of perspective of what's important and, uh, and, and also being able to put aside all of those things that distract you from that. Well, you've said um, taking care of the people of the country as best you can. And I think that's a, a, a pretty good description of leadership uh, right there. And I wanna thank you for your leadership. I wanna thank you on behalf of uh, 
of PPF. I want to thank you on behalf of the people of the audience, and I want to thank you on behalf of the people of the country for uh, for helping take care of us and taking helping us confront uh, the wounds that we have uh, in our history, and that uh, the optimism that you have that uh, that we can reconcile them. So, thank you so much for uh, for your time uh, this evening. Thank you very much, and thank you again for the honor that you bestowed upon me. And, and thank you to the other honorees and uh, participants tonight. I, I really appreciated being part of this circle of, uh, of uh, strength that you created. And now it just gives me another impetus to get out there and start doing something. So I'm almost as good as you. That's good. Well, I'm going to call you back tomorrow and just make sure that that uh, uh, award is over your shoulder still. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I actually should tell you that you run the risk of losing it because my daughter says that if, that she's got ambitions to take that one off of my desk. So I don't know if it's going to sit there much longer. <laughs> All right. Senator Sinclair, thank you. Um, I'd, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, welcome Ilsa Trunicht, Chair of the Public Policy Forum's Board of Directors, for closing remarks. Thanks very much, Ed, and to you and Julie and, and the team for uh, hosting us tonight. And I just want to, on behalf of the Board of the Public Policy Forum, also extend our extremely warm congratulations to our 2020 honorees. Um, we're deeply grateful that you have accepted this honor and of course for your extraordinary and ongoing contributions to Canada. Um, and thank you for so generously sharing your, your insights and your, your wisdom uh, with us tonight. Uh, also a huge thank you to all of you, our guests, for participating in this first uh, virtual testimonial dinner. We hope, uh, we hope you enjoyed these rich and frankly quite uh, quite special uh, conversations we've just witnessed. Um, and just like when we celebrated uh, the testimonial dinner in our honor breeze in person, I'm certainly leaving tonight uh, inspired and energized by the commitment to Canada and to excellence in public service. And, um, and I'm also uh, just filled with gratitude to be part of a community that shares PPF's uh, fundamental belief that uh, better policy is essential for a better Canada and for better opportunities for all Canadians. And it's your engagement in this community that makes the work of the PPF possible and makes it worthwhile. So thank you so much. Um, I want to close by thanking our partners who support we, we appreciate so much. Um, thank you to our lead partner, CN to TD Bank Group, the presenting partner of our Emerging Leader Award, Bespoke Audiovisual, Amazon, BCIT, Manulife, National Public Relations, Power Corporation of Canada, Tech Resources Limited, the University of British Columbia, Watershed Partners, and Indigo. And since we had the chance tonight to uh, celebrate and honor Shingai as uh, with the Emerging Leader Award, um, and we had that glitch on the video. I'd like to take a moment to, to extend a special thank you to our lead private sector uh, partner for the Action Canada Fellowship, um, Power Corporation of Canada. For the last three years or so, Power Corp has generally uh, supported this extremely unique and wonderful public policy leadership development program that, that aims to enhance the understanding of Canada among an amazing group of, of young policy leaders and um, give them that depth of understanding of, of the policy choices of the future. Uh, merci beaucoup. And I now want to invite all of you to join our networking lounges um, where you can stay and connect with some friends and, and uh, fellow participants. And it may even be easier to find them than in that incredibly crowded foyer of the Convention Center in Toronto. So, so please do participate. Um, and I would, would like us to, to ask our team to replay the video, this time with sound out on as you, uh, as you join um, the networking lounges. And thank you everyone again and enjoy the rest of your evening. Next to rocky shores and small town corner stores, between forests and freeways, and through northern towns on sunlit days. 
you'll find a driven group of dreamers, makers, thinkers, and creators who want to explore, understand, and know more about how jobs are changing. Looking beyond the political buzz to develop policy that works for all of us. Policy that's with and not just for. Created together, not behind closed doors. You'll find leaders on a journey, developing within themselves and in each other, the mindsets, relations, and courage to lead, each in their own way, but never alone. Because great policy doesn't happen on its own. We want Canada's brightest for the future of public policy. Policy happens together. D'un bout à l'autre du pays, de ces rivages, à ces villages, de ces forêts et ces routes mythiques, jusqu'à ces villes nordiques, se trouve un groupe de rêveurs, de bâtisseurs, de penseurs et de créateurs qui souhaitent explorer, comprendre et analyser l'évolution des métiers et les approches pour les améliorer. En allant au-delà des clivages pour créer des politiques équilibrées, des politiques inclusives, conçues de façon transparente et collaborative. Ces leaders œuvrent sans relâche à cultiver en eux et entre eux les idées, les relations et le courage requis pour diriger. Chacun à sa façon, mais toujours en collaboration, puisqu'une bonne politique n'est jamais le fruit du hasard. Nous voulons des visionnaires pour réfléchir aux politiques publiques de demain. Les politiques se réalisent en équipe.